Welcome to Island Baptist Church's digital edition for this 11 a.m. service on April the 19th. We're glad that you've joined us, and I hope that you had an enjoyable Easter weekend and Easter week. Uh, for those who are able to have time off from work, I hope that was refreshing for you, and also that you've been able to meditate along with the rest of us about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Of course, this time is really an unusual time, not only for Island Baptist Church, but now for many of the people around the world. They're getting into the same situation that we've been in for quite a while. There's a lot of social distancing. There's a lot of staying at home. And so if you're watching this video from home, as I expect you are on this weekend of April, uh, we want to welcome you and thank you for joining us. I'm also excited today because we've had a series of messages where we had been away from the book of the Bible we were studying for a while, but today we are back in the book of Hebrews. And I would like to invite you to turn to the book of Hebrews. And as we're turning there, we're going to be in chapters 9 and 10 again. Let's pray briefly and ask God to bless this time together. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Father, that right now around the world there are brothers and sisters in Christ who are getting together to sing your praises, to sing in their hearts, to sing in their homes. But also, Father, they are picking up your word and opening it up, and they are getting back into the revelation that you've given to us. We thank you, Father, for giving us your word that reveals your Son, Jesus Christ. It shows the salvation that we have in him. And today, as we study the book of Hebrews, I ask that you would open our eyes, that you would illumine us, Father, if, those are, if there are those who are listening who are not your children, who have never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, may they be convicted by what they hear, and may they trust him today before it's too late. And for the Christians, Lord, as we listen again to this story of salvation, help us to be thankful, to be appreciative, and Father, to realize the love that you've shown to us, to realize that we are debtors to your love, and help us, Father, to be ready to meet you someday and to stand before you. We ask that you would bless our time together. Also, we pray, Lord, for all those who are suffering because of the coronavirus outbreak and pandemic. We ask that you would comfort hearts and encourage people, that you would allow Christians not to be fearful, but, Father, for them to carry on and be strong as they follow after your Son in this short little while we have here on earth. We love you, and we ask that you would be pleased with what we do this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I was saying before our prayer, we are back in our study of the book of Hebrews. And if you were with us a few Sundays ago, we had overviewed not only Hebrews 9 and 10, but also 11 and 12. And we had mentioned a few things there about the idea of leaving a place and going somewhere else. But before we leave chapters 9 and 10, there's a few more things that I wanted to, to remind us of in this a wonderful, really a tapestry that is woven together that is teaching us so many things about Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done for you and for me. And the title of the message today is Time and Eternity. It's very neat if you study your Bible and you notice how many times certain passages use certain words. And in Hebrews chapter 9, the word time, at least in the Bible that we're using, the King James Bible, is mentioned three times. And the word eternity or eternal is mentioned three times as well. And I thought there was a good contrast here for us to see what was God was God doing in time and also what God has established for you and me of an eternal nature in these two chapters. So today, since we've been away for a while, we're returning to the book, and I wanted to remind you of a few things. So far, in the book of Hebrews, we had seen Jesus Christ as being greater than the angels by far. We also saw that Jesus Christ was so much greater than Moses and what Moses had provided to the nation of Israel. Remember, in the name of the book, the book Hebrews reminds us that this letter was written especially to Hebrew or Jewish Christians or Jews and Hebrews who were on the cusp. They were on the border of becoming Christians. Perhaps they were attending early churches. They were getting together with Christians, but some of them had not yet made that commitment of faith to trust in God's offer of salvation in Jesus Christ. And those Jewish believers and that Jewish audience needed to know that Jesus Christ was greater far than the worship and the interest in angels that the Jewish people had had, greater even far than Moses, who had been the one who gave God's great law to the nation. And when we saw in the last few chapters, really beginning around chapters 4 and 5, we began to discover all the way up through chapters 9 and 10 that Jesus Christ is both the greatest offerer, like a priest making offerings to God and sacrifices to God, but he was also himself the offering and the sacrifice. 
As John's gospel tells us, he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So we've seen this so far in the book of Hebrews, and that brings us up to speed to where we are in the book today. But we've got to remember, if we want to understand chapters 9 and 10, and really everything that's gone before, we've got to remember that this message was heralding and announcing a tremendous change for the Jewish people. A tremendous change to the Hebrews was being revealed in the Gospels, in the epistles of Paul, the writings of James, the writings of Peter, and here this author of Hebrews was telling a great change for the nation of Israel. And for us, as we try to understand this as we enter into our message today, really what we're discovering is Jesus Christ was the mediator, as Hebrews says, of a greater and a better covenant, a greater testament, a greater promise. In fact, our Bibles, you'll know, are divided between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament contains, of course, the law. It contains the histories of Israel. It contains prophecy, most of which we can say have a wonderful role in pointing towards Jesus Christ. It contains poetry and many other things that were focused on the Jewish nation as they were God's chosen people. But in the New Testament, the new covenant that Jesus Christ was establishing, the promises of God, the family of God, the covenant of God was opening up even greater and farther and universally. And for the Hebrew nation, this was really going to be something that was quite, uh, we could say, a stretch for them and something that the writer of Hebrews was working very hard to convey to them. Jesus Christ himself was the one bringing in this greater covenant. This meant tremendous change for the Jewish nation. We're going to see that again today as we wrap up chapters 9 and 10. But it meant that the sacrificial system was going to be over. It meant that the temple on earth was going to be unnecessary. Jesus Christ had even said it was going to be destroyed. It meant that the type of keeping of the Mosaic law that they thought was going to enable them to be in a good standing or a right standing with God was no longer necessary in the same way. It was a tremendous change, but also this new covenant brought a tremendous impact because just as God had, had expected the Jewish nation in the Old Testament to obey his laws, to be faithful to his covenant, now God is expecting men and women everywhere people all over the world to trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior for the forgiveness of their sin. And Jesus Christ would say in passages speaking of God's love, like John chapter 3, that those who reject Jesus Christ, who do not accept him as their Savior, are already rejected because they're still bearing the weight of God's condemnation and wrath. So there was a tremendous impact if people were to reject this New Testament. And for the nation of the Jews, the Hebrews, perhaps for them, it would be among the most difficult, the hardest for them to accept that new covenant. And so there was a tremendous risk that the writer of Hebrews was trying to convey that the Jewish people, the Hebrews, who had received the promises, who would, had been the people of God, who had received so much revelation and so many blessings and were a special part of God's promise, there was a cr tremendous risk if they would turn away from their own Messiah. And this is why, by the way, in our Bibles, we see there's a large section that we go through chapters 5 and 6 all the way up to chapter 10 that is explaining over and over and over Christ's priestly role in this new covenant. Maybe some of you are wondering if you're studying chapters 6 and 7 and 8 and 9 and 10, it seems like the writer of Hebrews is saying the same thing in many different ways, and he is. He's describing how Jesus Christ is our great high priest. I listed some of the things here that are mentioned, his sacrifice, his mediation, that he's a part of the Melchizedek priesthood. He has anchored our salvation in the holiest of holies. He opened the veil so we can have access into the presence of God. He's redeemed us. He's adopted us. But as you saw already, this is why those sections are bracketed. They're bookended on both sides by a really strong warning. You'll remember chapters 5 and 6 are so strong in their warning that it even causes some Christians to wonder if they could lose their salvation. Chapter 10, we're going to see the same thing again in the weeks ahead. That's why I wanted us to make sure we went slowly, and today, before we left, chapters 9 and 10, you understand the salvation that's in Jesus Christ, 
And you understand for that Hebrew audience at first, they needed those strong warnings to not stay on the fence, to not stay in the borderlands of indecision. Friends, if you're listening today, you may be in the same position as some of those Hebrew listeners to where you've listened about Jesus Christ, you've come along for the ride, you've listened to a lot of these messages about Jesus Christ, but you have not yet surrendered your life to God. You've not yet asked God for forgiveness of your sins, and you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ. Those warning passages are going to be for you as well. But today, I think it's really going to help us to see the ideas of God's work in time and God's work in eternity so that you and I can see our salvation is secure. That's the ironic thing about these passages. Yes, there's a warning at the beginning. Yes, there's a warning at the end. But if you pay attention to this central section, you realize your salvation is secured, not by what you have done or what you are going to do, but what Jesus Christ himself has done. So in this message today, we're going to go pretty quickly through chapters 9 and 10 to remind you of what Jesus Christ did for us, to remind you of God's plan at the perfect time in the fullness of time in history. Now, the first thing we're going to see when it comes to the time mentioned in Hebrews chapter 9 is the time of representation. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by the time of representation? I mean that God was using figures, symbols, imagery, and types to represent the truth of what was coming. God was prefiguring the coming and the salvation of Jesus Christ by the sacrificial system in the Old Testament, the Mosaic law and the Levitical priesthood. Those were figures of the true, and that was in the past. If you look in your Bibles in Hebrews chapter 9, really verses 1 through 10 describe this. We will not read all these verses again, but you can study this. I encourage you in your own time. When we talk about this first covenant and this first testimony, it says in verse 1 that it was the ordinances of a divine service and a worldly sanctuary. That means it was here on earth and it was not the real and true in the heavens. It goes on, as we mentioned before, to describe the tabernacle, the things and the rituals that were done there. But I would like for you to look with me in your Bibles as this goes on. Verse 9 says, These things were a figure for the time then present. That's our word there. The time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances. Now, there's more to that verse, which we'll come to in just a minute. But these rituals were figures. This is also mentioned again in verse 24. It says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. That's talking about the tabernacle originally, but also the temple there in Jerusalem, which are figures of the true. They were not actually the real place where salvation was going to be accomplished. Instead, verse 24 says, Jesus Christ would enter into heaven itself. Also, the word patterns is used. If you go backwards one verse, it says it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens. So what Moses had received from God was the pattern of a heavenly ritual, that heavenly truth. The temple was modeled after the tabernacle system. But all these things were only shadows of Christ's coming sacrifice. In chapter 10 and verse 1, it says, The law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. Even though those sacrifices were offered over and over again, sometimes with great sincerity, they were just shadows that were prefiguring and pointing towards the real sacrifice of Jesus Christ that was to come. Friends, by the way, let me encourage you, don't dismiss the Old Testament stories. Don't dismiss the keeping of the Levitical law in the Old Testament or the details about the tabernacle and later Solomon's temple because they are rich in their significance as they point to Jesus Christ. And they give us a, a much richer understanding of who he is and what he did for us when we see those symbols and those figures that were used. Yet we have to remember they were not the substance they were only shadows of what was to come. The offering of sacrifice and the keeping of the full Mosaic law was therefore only temporary. It was only temporary. 
what I'd like to say in conclusion about this time, the time of representation was now, now that this is accomplished, the salvation of Jesus Christ, that time is in the past. You and I can't go back to it, as I shared with you a couple of weeks ago. Now is the time for us to turn away from those types and to turn to the truth, the true salvation offered in Jesus Christ. Now, in my Bible, I'm going to turn very briefly to the book of Colossians. I've mentioned to you, this to you before, and probably we will mention this again before we leave the book of Hebrews. But the Apostle Paul uses the, the word shadows again in Colossians chapter 2. Some people were distracting the early Christians and trying to draw them away from the simple faith in Jesus Christ, some back to a legalistic observance of rituals, some back to philosophical notions of what we would eventually think of as Gnosticism. But whenever there was this idea that someone had that your faith and mine was incomplete if we weren't following through those old rituals, Paul puts that to rest and says that it's wrong. Let me read to you some of the words that he says after mentioning the salvation Jesus Christ accomplished for us. Since Jesus Christ has saved us, therefore, verse 16 of chapter 2 in Colossians says, Therefore, let no man judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ. Those rituals, and yes, even the holiday, holidays and the holy days that the Jews celebrated, they were simply pointing towards Jesus Christ. So for you and for me, we don't have to be consumed with trying to keep those old rituals in those way. In fact, as this would go on, it says that we need to focus on Jesus Christ, our head, who is seated in heavenly places. That's what that time of representation was. But the next thing we see is there was also in Hebrews chapter 9, the time of reformation. Maybe some of you, you skimmed down in your Bibles as I was reading in chapter 9, verse 10, because verse 10 at the end of the says that all that had gone before with those symbols and the pictures and the imagery that was all in place until the time of Reformation. Again, verse 10 says, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings, carnal ordinances, that's the Old Testament system, imposed on them, they had to do it, until the time of Reformation. Now, in your Bibles, this description of the time of Reformation is going to go on again from in chapters 9, in verse 11, all the way up into chapter 10, and, and really verse 18. But what does the word Reformation use? Some of you know that there was a, a period in history, we say, in Europe that would eventually affect everyone that came after a long period of darkness, spiritually speaking. The reason why that word Reformation is appropriate for that period of history is because people during the Middle Ages, and sadly, people even during the early and late church period, they had begun to go back to the Old Testament system. You say, really? They were worshiping as Jews? Well, not exactly, but people in churches like what we today would call the Roman Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox churches, they had gone back to trying to accomplish their salvation partly through their works. Yes, faith was a part of what they believed, but also they believed that if they did not do the works, if they did not keep a certain type of law of their church, then they would not be saved. So there was a need for reformation in the same way that we see it used here. Reformation means change, and the change that was being spoken of here in the book of Hebrews was Christ's offering of his own blood. Some of the changes that we see in these passages are, first of all, Jesus Christ, as he offered his own blood, finished our salvation. Verses 11 and 12 says, But Christ being come, and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained redemp eternal redemption, for us. If you skip down to verse 28, it says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Chapter 10 and verse 10 says, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You're beginning to see this, I hope, that one of the great changes was our salvation was not focused on our obedience to the law, but Jesus Christ's perfect sacrifice of himself. 
His sacrifice, his salvation has freed us from sin. Verses 17 and 18 of chapter 10 say, Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sins. Now, Christian friends, again, remember for you and for me, this seems normal. This seems natural. We're very thankful for it. But consider how difficult this would be for the Jewish believers to accept that now there were no more offerings for sin. As I mentioned with those other old churches that had perverted the word of God and, and gone back to the old ways, there is no need for that sacrificial mass to offer the blood of Jesus Christ again because it's finished and done. Again, further, reformation was given to us because Jesus Christ has ended our dead works. Those things that we might try to do are no longer necessary. The things that we might try to do to earn a righteousness or a good standing with God, not necessary. Uh, chapter 9, if you look at these verses here, it says 13 and 14, the blood of bulls and goats, the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, it sanctified to the purifying of the flesh. It had an outward effect in the Old Testament. But how much more shall the blood of Christ, through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? This is to remind us in chapter 10, we'll do the same thing in verses 1 through 8, that now our dead works trying to save ourselves are over. And now, ironically, we can finally serve God in a spiritual way, a way that pleases Him. We're not working to earn our salvation, but we're serving God because we love Him. And finally, of course, in this time of Reformation, it established the new covenant, the new promise of God, the New Testament. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 through 23, I will not read all of these, but it says that Jesus Christ is now the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under that first testament, even the Old Testament law, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Many of these verses will go on to describe this second, this New Testament. Chapter 10 and verse 9 says, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God, speaking of Christ, he taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, that great and new testament. Now, friends, let, let me say a few things for you and me as we think about the time of representation and the time of reformation. The application I have down at the bottom is to, to remind us Christ has saved us, and he's done that which we could not do. But let me say a few things about the time of representation, when there were the figures of the true and the tabernacle and the temple, and let me talk about this time of reformation. First of all, for that past period of time, for the Jewish people, they had to realize that the old sacrifices, the old works, they were insufficient, they were not enough, and they were temporary. They were going to be done away with. But friends, maybe you're listening to this message. You're not, you're not Jewish. You may be, but you are not yet a Christian. And you say, Pastor, I do believe there's a God. I do believe in Jesus Christ in some sense and in some way. I want to be a good person. I want to be a Christian, but I believe I've got to work hard. I believe that there's something I need to do in order for me to be saved. Friends, you are missing the picture, literally. You're missing the idea that's presented here in Hebrews that Jesus Christ has already fulfilled all that you could ever hope to do or plan to do. He even fulfilled the perfect plan of God in the temple and in the tabernacle. That was temporary. It's done away with. And here's the important thing. What God is asking of you, what God is demanding of you now is for you to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And for you and for me, for people in the world to tell God that we'll try to work our salvation out, we're actually refusing and rejecting God's plan of salvation. Now, Christian friends, let me make some application for you and for me about this time of representation in the past and the figures of the true. For you and for me, even though we've trusted Jesus Christ 100% for the forgiveness of our sins, there's still a risk, there's still a danger that we would fall back into old habits fall into old habits. You say, Pastor, what do you mean by that? Well, you might fall back into the old habit of being fearful that you're not going to be accepted unless you do A, B, C, and D. 
that if you don't do the right thing at the right time in the right way, that maybe somehow either you'll lose your salvation or somehow that proves that you were not or are not saved. Now, friends, let me say this. When you look at the scriptures and we find men and women who are people of faith, we're going to see them again in Hebrews coming up soon, you don't find anyone who was perfect other than our Lord Jesus Christ. And that reminds us your security is not about you and your performance. It's about what Jesus Christ has already done. The other thing I'll say is don't fall back into the old habit of just going through the motions, just going through the rituals of your Christian faith. Let me make it very applicable today. Don't say, okay, it's Sunday. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to watch this message from IBC for however many minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and I'll check that off the box, and I'll be done for the week. There you go. I'm a Christian serving the Lord. Listen, don't just go through the motion of checking off boxes, whether it be watching a message from IBC, reading your Bible for 15 minutes, saying the Lord's Prayer. Don't get back into that old habit of an empty ritual. You and I have been blessed to enter into a real and living relationship with God. Don't fall back into that old pattern of just trying to go through the motions. Instead, remember that your walk with the Lord is a spiritual one, a personal one, and the one that needs to be vibrant and true. So friends, pray and ask God today to revive your heart again, to make sure you're just not becoming a ritualized religious Christian, but one who is pursuing that relationship and faithfulness to God. Now let's talk about this time of Reformation. Let me make a couple of applications when it comes to the time that we are in now. Unsafe friends, what the Hebrews had to learn was they needed to accept the finished work of Jesus Christ. It wasn't enough to understand it. It wasn't enough to hear it. It wasn't enough to be blessed by being around Christians, even being convicted by the Holy Spirit. They needed to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. You need to do the same thing today. The work is finished. The task is done. Christ has saved us, and he's done what we could not do. So all that remains for you, sinner friends, is to trust him and accept that free gift of salvation. Now, Christians, what about for you and for me in this present, during this time when Jesus Christ has finished the task? Well, well, for me, when I look at what Jesus Christ has done, offering himself with his own blood, finishing my salvation, putting my dead works aside and letting me serve him in spirit and in truth, establishing a new covenant and a new promise that's never going to be broken, that inspires me to gratitude to God, to love to God, to a feeling of indebtedness that I need to serve him and show my love to him because he loved me so much. Now, friends, during this time of the pandemic, just like you might be getting into some of those old rituals just by checking off the boxes, maybe now in the times when we have to stay at home, when our workplace activity is limited, whenever our uh, entertainment is limited, when our staying at home is limited, maybe for some of you, the ways that you try to serve God, the way you try to evangelize, share the gospel, serve the Lord, that's been limited. And here's the thing I want to suggest. Maybe someone needs to think about this. You can still serve the Lord at home where you are. You can still serve the Lord in private. You say, but pastor, nobody's going to see me. Nobody's going to know what I'm doing for the Lord. Nobody's going to hear of my testimony. And, and you're mistaken about that because there is someone who watches you every day, every moment of the day, and who sees you, and that's the Lord. He sees the things we do for him. So in your apartment, in your home, wherever you are, you can still walk faithfully with the Lord and he sees what you do for him. Even in the confines of whatever space you're in, even as restricted as your social life has become, you and I can still serve him in private. And Jesus Christ said, your father who sees you will reward you openly if you're trying to serve him and be faithful, regardless of whether or not anybody sees what you're doing. So for me, when I think about what Christ has done for me, it makes me want to serve him all the more. And may God help us to be better in serving him, even during this time of pandemic season. Now, lastly, the last time we want to mention is mentioned just very briefly at the very end of chapter 9. If you look down in your Bibles in chapter 9, as it goes on, it's describing what Jesus Christ had done. I'll read verse 28 for you once again. It says, So Christ was once offered 
to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. The Hebrews had been expecting a triumphant Messiah. They were expecting a Savior who was going to come in on a white steed and, and destroy their adversaries to get rid of the enemies in their day, to get rid of the Roman oppressors. But instead, Jesus Christ came and he was a suffering servant, as was predicted in the prophecies of Isaiah in the Old Testament. But he came, and instead of freeing them from the shackles of Rome, instead he came to save them from their sins. He became someone who was humble and lowly, who did not lift himself up in a way that was going to attract attention like they were hoping, although Jesus Christ did attract attention to draw all people to him who would come to him. But... You know, as we just celebrated last week and this past weekend, he ultimately was led to the cross, he was put to the death, and he died on the cross as a sacrifice for our sins. He was laid low into the grave, and then he rose victoriously, but even in that victory, it was not what the Jewish people had been looking for. They were looking for this military or political or this national leader, again, to bring them to this type of rescue. But what we know is Jesus Christ is coming again. His first coming was a coming of sacrifice, and his second coming is a time of triumph over his enemies. Chapter 10 says the same thing, quoting from the Psalms. It says, from henceforth, in verse 13, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. He is going to come again. He will triumph over his enemies, and he will appear for you and for me. So, Christian friends, are you ready for the coming of the Lord? Are you looking forward to his coming and his arrival? Are you going to be found working, serving him, faithful to him? Or are we going to be found doing something, saying something, participating in something what we ought not be? This ought to be something we look forward to. Now, sinner friends, if you're not trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior now, you are not ready for this coming of the Lord. He's giving you a chance right now to bow the knee, to surrender and accept Him as Savior. And if you wait until it is too late, you will bow the knee, as Philippians tells us, but it will be too late for you. So trust Him today. Christians, let me make one application about this before we leave this. You and I are looking at a lot of things. We are on the Internet. We are in the newspapers, we are checking our phones, and we are looking at many, many things, messages and news. We want to know how many coronavirus cases there are. We want to know, sadly, how many deaths there are. We want to know, is the economy going to be reopened? Are we going to go back to normal? When can we fly planes? When can we go where we want to go? We've got so many questions, and I'm exactly like you are in this. But Christians, when is the last time you thought with any urgency and you thought with any expectation about the coming of our Lord, about Jesus Christ's return. I guarantee for most of us, we think more often these days about the situation we're in than about the Lord Jesus Christ and his return. Now, again, that's normal and it's natural, but friends, I hope you'll be challenged and convicted like I was to ask myself, am I expecting the Lord's return? Am I looking forward with as much eagerness to his return, which is really the best thing that's going to happen in eternity for me and for you and for this world, or am I looking with more eagerness about a return to normalcy, getting back to work, getting back to the old things? Now, friends, those are good and wonderful. I want to be back together with Island Baptist Church members in our church, but we ought to be looking with so much more urgency and expectation at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and hastening that day, doing what we can to serve him before he comes in triumph to bring us home to be with him forever. Now, friends, all those ways we talked about time were how God has worked in time, in history. And just very briefly, let me say this. Our God has worked out a salvation which is not just a part of time. It's not just a part of the past, but for its eternity. The subtitle of this is, There are unending promises God has given to us in our salvation. And this is important because remember, possibly next week or in the weeks to follow, we're going to get back into those warning passages. And I, I would dare say that many of us are going to be so unnerved and scared by what we see there. You need to remember 
that God has promised to us some eternal things in our salvation that won't pass away. First thing we see very simply is eternal redemption given to us by God. We've already read this in Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12. It says that Jesus Christ by his own blood has obtained eternal redemption for you and for me. That means we are rescued forever by what he's done, that finished work that he accomplished. Chapter 10 and verse 10 again. It says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. And listen to these words, once for all. It was done once and that action continues. Verse 12 says this, this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. These verses go on in the same way. You can read these in your own time. But Christ has redeemed us eternally. To redeem is to buy back, to, to buy out of, or to take someone out of a situation and the penalties that are there. Jesus Christ has redeemed us from our guilt and from our sin and from eternal separation from God, and he has accomplished our salvation. Now, friends, again, think about it. If it's eternal, it's ongoing. It's unending. It's forever. And nothing I can do, nothing you can do, nothing the devil can do, nothing this world can do, nothing a persecutor can do will ever separate us from that love of God and the redemption that he has provided for us. Praise God for his salvation that is secure, not because it is anchored in me, but because it's anchored in the finished work of Jesus Christ and his shed blood for me. The other thing that's lovely about this is we have an eternal inheritance that we are forever in the family of God. Chapter 9, again in verse 15, uses this phrase this way. It says, Jesus Christ, the mediator of the New Testament, by means of death for the redemption, there's our word again, of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. An inheritance, you will know, is something that you get because you belong to a family. You are the heir of someone. And so for us, through Jesus Christ, we now enter into a covenant relationship that's never going to be broken. It's never going to go away. Chapter 10, I love the way that this is described because it says, the Holy Ghost is a witness to us. Uh, Paul would say that the Holy Ghost is the earnest of our inheritance or the down payment. It shows us God's not going to throw us away or cast us out. It says, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I'll put my law into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. God the Father, through the work of the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ, offering his salvation, has made us a part of his family. And that is something that is never going to change. Friends, praise the Lord that even though we do need to be warned, we do need to be cautioned to make sure we truly have trusted in Jesus Christ. If you have, then the work is finished. You have eternal redemption and an unending inheritance that's never going to go away. It's never going to pass away. All those promises we have in God, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, a home in heaven, that we belong together with the saints, that we can stand before God, that we can go to him in prayer, that he is for us and he is not against us, that he loves us and that he watches over us, that he has a good purpose for you. On and on, that is never going to end because we're never going to leave his family. We also say as well, now we are treated like sons and daughters and we are no longer slaves to sin. Praise God for his unending promise and salvation. Here's, like how, here's how I would like to close uh, today, friends, as we look at this. We saw today in the perfect fullness of time, God accomplished our salvation. Some of you may be wondering, why did God have that time of symbols and types and the Old Testament tabernacle and the temple? God wanted us to see that we could not save ourselves. We could not keep the law perfectly. We needed someone who was perfect. We also saw that the salvation people were trying to get through sacrifices, it was unending. The shedding of blood never stopped. It was insufficient. But when Jesus Christ came onto the scene in the perfect fullness of time, we were able to see God's perfect offer of salvation. So friends, don't turn away and go back to that old system. It was God's plan 
his own provision and his promise that he was working out through history. So the question is, friends, have you accepted that gift of salvation? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Christian friends, are you still living in a way that's like the old promise in the Old Testament, or have you entered into that new promise? So are you and I, Christian friends, living in God's present grace for us with all the riches he's already provided, and are we looking forward to the future glory with him? Again, friends, I hope this sticks in your mind. I would be willing to, to say that many of you today and tomorrow will check the news, you'll look at the situation around the world, but friends, lift up your eyes because our redemption is drawing nigh. Jesus Christ is coming again, praise the Lord. We celebrated Easter and someday we're going to celebrate his second coming. Are you ready? Sinner friends, if you haven't trusted him as Savior, you're not ready. Christian friends, are you ready to meet your Lord and Savior? Let's pray and ask him to help us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these wonderful promises to us. It's amazing to us how the author of Hebrews in so many ways over and over again was trying to demonstrate from the Old Testament that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all the great hopes and the greatest ideals and the great pictures of the Old Testament promises. We're so blessed to live on this side of the cross and for Christians, all of this sounds natural and normal, but Lord, we realize that it was earth-shaking. It was a great change when Jesus Christ became the mediator of a New Testament. It was a great time of reformation. So, dear God, please help us to live in the full riches of that blessing. Help us to avail ourselves and make use of all these promises that you've given to us, the grace that we can depend on, and the love that we now owe to you because we see how clearly you loved us. Father, if there's anyone here today who's living in an Old Testament way, they're trying to earn their own salvation and make sacrifices to be accepted with you, may they cease from those dead works. May they trust in Jesus Christ so they can be made into a new creature. They can be transformed and they can be created into a new life of good works that really will please you because they have accepted your offer of salvation in Jesus Christ. And Lord, may we today and tomorrow and the day after, may we be looking for your son, Jesus Christ, and may they, that expectation change the way we live. Forgive us for the ways that we have failed you. Forgive us for spending more time looking at the news and looking at social media and looking at other things instead of looking at your word and looking up in expectation for your son's return. Make us more and more children of heaven and make us less and less people of this earth, we pray. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.